So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Gerhard Kramer. I'm one of the TPC co-chairs. Um, now, as you will have seen, hopefully, in an email that you received, there's been a program change this morning, and it had to do with flights that didn't make it from Chicago to Honolulu yesterday. So Ingrid Dobishi's her talk, her plenary talk, was moved to tomorrow. Uh, but we were very happy that Michael Waterman was able to swap positions, so he will be speaking this morning. So we thank them both for their, uh, th that they're willing to do this. So it is my uh, honor to introduce Professor Michael Waterman this morning. Michael Waterman is a professor of biological sciences, computer science, and mathematics at the University of Southern California. He holds an endowed associate's chair at USC. And before he came to USC in 1982, he held positions at Los Alamos National Lab Laboratory and Idaho State University. A few of his honors, he was named a Guggenheim Fellow in 1995. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1995 and he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2001. And in 2005, he was elected to the French Academy of Sciences. Now in his bio, he emphasizes that during a five-year period from 2003 to 2008, he held a five-year term as faculty master of Parkside International Residence College. Uh, this college is home to over 600 undergraduates and serves as a center for internationally oriented cultural, academic, and social events. And then beginning in May 2008, in addition to his USC appointment, he became a chair professor at Tsinghua University in Beijing. There he leads a team of scientists who will collectively work to enhance Tsinghua's programs in bioinformatics and computational biology. Uh, Professor Waterman works in the area of computational biology, biology, concentrating on the creation and application of math, statistics, and computer science to the area, and in particular to DNA, RNA, and protein sequence data. He is the co-developer of the Smith-Waterman algorithm for sequence comparison and of the Lander-Waterman formula for physical mapping. He is a founding editor of the Journal of Computational Biology and the author of uh, two books, texts on the topic. So with that introduction, it's my pleasure to ask Professor Waterman to the stage. Well, good morning. Um, it's, uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. and. Um, give me the, a chance to come back to Hawaii. I, several decades ago, I spent a year as a visiting uh, member of faculty at the University of Hawaii. And it was one of those pivotal years in my life. Um, I, I, I learned many things, including how to lay on a, a sand, uh, or excuse me, a straw mat near the beach and stay there for more than five minutes, which was just not in my uh, Thing. But one of the things I eventually did as I became more skilled at that was to read a copy of The Origin of the Species by Darwin that I found in some used bookstore in Honolulu. And biologists, you know, th there you can see a great biologist thinking um, in quite a bit of detail, and it's unlike anything an engineer or someone in the physical sciences would do. It's really, really interesting. So, um, I had another title for this talk, this kind of grand title. It was, was DNA sequencing and a little bit about DNA sequencing in the first 15% of the 21st century, but I didn't think the uh, organizers would like that title. <clears throat> uh, so this is a flyover of some fairly clean topics that come up in, in this area. So I'll talk about DNA sequence assembly, which is determining the underlying sequence in genomes, uh, until about uh, 2001, 2002. And then an amazing uh, set of technological developments took place uh, that I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about. And that required overhauling these assembly methods that had been in place, improved, but in place since the mid-70s. 
uh, through uh, Olerian graphs. And that brought up yet, an, that reduced the computation time, completely changed the problem, but it brought up a host of other issues, including storage. Um, and then there are <clears throat> issues of uh, when you're doing the sequencing, how much is out there? How much have you learned about this unknown text and how much is left to be learned? Uh, which is generally comes under the uh, topic of coverage. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, sequence comparison, which again, with these huge data sets, has to undergo a transformation. <clears throat> so that's DNA, uh, the, a few turns of the double helix. Um, this substance was not discovered until the 1880s, and it wasn't, uh, there were no proofs that had anything to do with inheritance until the mid-1940s, not everyone believed that paper. And it wasn't until 1953 with Crick and Watson and this beautiful uh, double helical structure. This uh, ribbon on the backbone is, is a sugar phosphate backbone, which has a directionality. And the two um, strands cannot form base pairs unless they're going the opposite direction. One, one's, one's pointed one way and the other one's pointed the other way. Uh, so that really began this uh, business. And it really um, <clears throat> was um, several years before DNA sequencing could, uh, could get going. So DNA is the genetic information for almost every organism on the planet. I just said double helix, complementary base pairs, uh, A pairs T, G pairs C for our purposes. Uh, the bacteria, which uh, are living all over and on us and in us, have about 5 million base pairs, a little less than 5 million base pairs. And uh, you and I have 3 billion base pairs. And if you count mom, the, the DNA you got from mom and the DNA you got from dad, it's 6 billion base pairs. And of course, as we know, mom and dad were different, so there are some changes in those two, uh, two double helices. So there's a meter or so of DNA in every cell, about, say, 20 microns across, and you stuff that much DNA into that small place. And it isn't just getting it in there. It's, it's having organized well enough so you can find the genes you want to operate when you want to operate them. So cell division can take place. So you can uh, create gametes and have children. Uh, this is an ama amazing uh, organizational feat that we're, we're still learning about. So now I want to go to the to DNA sequencing as invented by Fred Sanger <clears throat> in the mid-1970s, for which he got his second Nobel Prize. <clears throat> and uh, so the idea is the, the top strand there, the, where it says DNA strand, is the unknown DNA that you want to read. Uh, there's uh, a primer that has uh, gives a place for a, a a protein called DNA polymerase to bind and start putting in the complementary base pairs. That's how we get two double helices from one. Uh, now, that's, that's no, cells do that all the time. But Sanger's trick was to have four different reactions. And the A reaction, for example, he put in some A's that would terminate the chain that couldn't go on, and there were some A's that could go on. So in this, uh, actually it's T's in this case, I apologize. So uh, the, the uh, polymerase will proceed until it comes to the first T, opposite which it puts an A. Some of those A's will be non-extending. There are millions of these molecules sitting in there. And other molecules extend until they try to put in the next T. So you get a set of double-stranded molecules terminating at the T's in the sequence you're trying to learn. You do that for ATGC and uh, then try to read those lengths and you can, if you had those exactly, you would know the underlying sequence. Um, <clears throat> this is an idealized picture of that. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the um, molecules uh, are put under an electric field with an acrylamide substance and the, the short ones go really fast, and the long ones get tangled up and go more slowly, so they get separated by size. Uh, no gel ever looked like this. Uh, when I first got to USC in the mid-'80s, my friends were taking sheets of glass, uh, putting, holding them together with, with huge paper clips, 
uh, pouring a gel down. There were wires all over the place to put the field, and, and, and the lanes ran nothing like straight. They ran kind of like this. You, could, you couldn't tell what went before what. So this was quite challenging. <clears throat> but um, as we went through the, the 80s and then the 90s, things became really improved. Uh, Lee Hood pioneered automatic sequencing machines. Uh, the label to see where the, where the DNA molecule got stuck uh, became fluorescent dyes. And there were four different colored dyes, so you could run everything in one channel, cutting down the material cost by a factor of four right there. Uh, and then they got, the channels got smaller and smaller. So all the way through the Human Genome Project, ending 2001, 2002, there were souped up versions of Fred Sanger's method for reading, reading DNA. But what happens in this newer fluorescent dye thing <clears throat> is instead of doing pattern recognition, trying to see where those blurs were on the, on the uh, gel, uh, you could detect the molecules as they were going by a uh, fluorescent detector and you, get, you ended up with image processing. So the, the reads look like this instead of what I was just showing you up here. Um, and however well these colors show up, there's a different color for every base. And the signals are of different strengths. Um, when there are runs of the same base together, it's often hard to tell whether there were three or four of them and so on. Things get uh, convoluted, no, uh, pun intended, I guess. And there's some length past which you can't. Uh, things just get uh, all uh, stuck together, and you cannot uh, read. So cannot read. So these reads got up to to 800 uh, or so base pairs. So uh, again, if you don't know anything about this subject, you don't just start at one end of the three billions and read letter by letter. You get to read pieces of it. <clears throat> so here's a little more of the of the recent history. In 1995, the Institute for Genome Research uh, sequenced the first uh, free living organism. Uh, about two million base pairs of bacteria. In 1996, there was a <clears throat> consortium of mostly European labs that sequenced yeast, uh, 12 million base pairs. In 1998, the worm C. elegans uh, was sequenced, eventually a Nobel Prize for this work. And um, <clears throat> the Human Genome Project started in the, in the 90s. Uh, Solera was this private company It said, oh, why doesn't the government just forget it? This, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just sequence the whole human genome ourselves. And they practice by, by sequencing Drosophila about 1.4, uh, 140 million base pairs. So around 2000, the announcements of the human genome sequence uh, started coming out. Uh, so what is this process, this compunosal process that goes on underneath? These reads are, and, and incidentally, they're nowhere nearly as uniformly uh, spread out as this, but this is a nice picture. Um, the, the reads are randomly located on the target. And uh, Roger Staden, <clears throat> back in, when Sanger was starting, Roger Staden uh, wrote a program to uh, put together these reads and try to uh, assemble the underlying sequence. And it's exactly what you'd do if you didn't have more than three minutes to do it. You would look for the reads that had the most overlap. You would glue those together and call it a larger read, and you would do a greedy algorithm. And that's a quick uh, and, uh, and um, uh, pretty pr sometimes efficient process. Um, and uh, I guess shotgun sequencing was mostly what I'll talk about. You have an unknown genome, and you're trying to piece the whole thing together with these short reads. So there's an element of randomness about this. And there are all kinds of details about the, uh, the sequence. So um, the reason I've written a read as a sequence of nucleotides of length 30 to 800 is that we'll, we'll come to some short reads in a little while. Uh, and these reads aren't perfect. There's, there's two kinds of error. There's the letters can be wrong, uh, and, and especially these, these when they're um, runs of the, the identical letter. But there also can be insertions and deletions. There can be a DNA that's added that shouldn't be there, or there can be DNA that's missing that should be there. And especially short insertions and deletions happen, and that makes the combinatorics harder. And something I haven't told you, but I did when I talked about the double helix, um, we're sequencing this double helix. The, uh, 
the molecule becomes single-stranded, and you don't know which strand you have. So when you get a read, you've got to, when you get a set of reads, you've got to get them all oriented the same way. So there's a fa two to the number of reads uh, arrangements of these things as well. It doesn't make life easier. Uh, and just if that wasn't hard enough, the human genome is riddled with repeats. There's a famous ALU repeat, a little over 300 letters long, that occurs a million times in our genome, 85%, 90% identity. So they're just stuttered all over 10% of the DNA that you got from mom and dad is this ALU repeat stuck all over the place. And of course, when we're trying to do this overlap and do the underlying assembly, that's not going to make life easier. And as you can see in this picture, where two repeats some distance apart, if you're do doing this greedy algorithm, they probably get popped on top of one another. You have to think about um, how, to, how to unresolve those things. <clears throat> so here's the uh, modern version of Roger Staten's uh, approach. <clears throat> Take all the reads and look for the ones that potentially overlap. Um, and we'll be, we'll be talking about millions of reads. So, and again, you don't know the orientation, so you do have a quadratic number of overlaps potentially. So you find all the ones you think are, poten are potential overlaps you want to take serious, then you have to cluster them together into consistent overlaps that make islands or what, what the business calls contigs, islands of overlapping reads that are mutually consistent and that you believe. And when you've got all those, you have to do a multiple alignment. This depth might be five, six, seven, eight for the Human Genome Project. And then, you know, you've got all these letters that are wrong here and there. You've got some spacing that's not right. You've got to do a multiple alignment to get the underlying text that you're after. And I'll talk a little bit about a, sort of a straw man version of how hard the overlaps are. That's the easiest of these three steps, far and away the easiest one. But in the end, you want the, uh, the DNA sequence of the uh, genome you're trying to get. So I'm going to so set up a, a straw uh, algorithm here just, to, just to, to try to impress you with the order of magnitude of the computations. So to do uh, overlap computation in a completely rigorous way, um, it takes quadratic time. And so essentially you can do this with, with scoring and so on, allowing for these insertions and deletions uh, to take place um, by uh, essentially um, examining each pair of letters from the top sequence with the bottom sequence. There's a dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, people don't do this in genome projects, but I'm going to pretend they do and set up, set this up. Okay. So here's Solera's project for the human genome. They had 20, uh, 26.5 million reads, average 550 letters. So there's seven times 10 to the 14th pairs of reads, and if we really did what I said before with the dynamic programming algorithm, each one of those would take 550 squared time. And so the total resources just to do the overlap would be a 2 times 10 to the 20th. Now, clearly, that's not what they did at Solera. People were very smart about these overlaps, et cetera, but this is a big problem. And I think at the time, um, at the time Solera was assembling the human genome, they had the largest computer facility outside of, of defense departments and CIA, whatever, that on, on, on Earth. Uh, and it was all, kind, all kinds of different scales of computation. It was really an impressive place. <clears throat> and they had built this building in Rockville for, for doing the human genome. And there were a few, three, two, three big rooms, um, not quite as large, maybe two-thirds as large as this room. And uh, there was a plan was that there would be labs and people would be doing all of the cloning and the da 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 da. And when I got there, there were two or three of the machines in this picture off on the corner, next to the wall, and on the corner against the wall. And I thought this was the mo this was the most modern thing I'd ever seen in my life. I just was amazed by this. 
And I look at this now, and it's sort of like a horse-pulled buggy. It looks so, so out of date and clunky, and how could I have ever been impressed with this? Uh, and, this and that's not very many years ago. So what I'm trying to impress you with is that assembling uh, genomes, just reading the underlying genome, forgetting anything about what it might really mean, uh, is, a, is a big challenge. Um, and I know some of you went to a uh, workshop on, on DNA sequencing here, so you know everything I'm saying. I apologize for repeating it. But, uh, and and the, the computer programs used in the human genome program uh, were really Roger Staden's original uh, invention made very sophisticated by people like Gene Myers and others. And uh, these people were really smart and they worked really hard. And then we started into this first decade of the century, and uh, don't, you can't read this slide carefully and I don't want you to, but on the left is a logarithmic plot of the cost of sequencing, and from 2000 to 2006, it's plummeting. And the capacity of one DNA sequencing machine, like you just saw a picture of, is exponentially uh, increasing. Now, the list of companies, this is probably 2006, the list of companies here, I think two of them, two or three of them still exist. So that they were the next generation sequencing guys. And what were they doing? What was this incredible technology? Um, Illumina is the the big dog in this business, and so I'll talk about uh, a little, just a little bit about the technology in this Selexa. <clears throat> so here's the picture, and, and in some way it's not unrelated to what um, was, be, was being done before. You, you take, you get um, pieces of DNA that you want to, uh, to read, you, attack, you get attached to the end of specific adapters that you know the sequence of, but the rest, that's the dark part of the upper left there. The rest of it you don't know anything about. Then you get these guys to, to stick to a, a surface, a little, a little slide, a little slide. Uh, and so there'll be millions of these unknown single-stranded pieces of DNA that get stuck by the adapter. And then through uh, quite an intricate process, in each point where, where an unknown molecule gets stuck, it gets reproduced over and over again. So there's a clump of identical but unknown pieces of DNA st sticking up, hanging off of this, uh, this plate. And there's just places all over the place. You have no idea what, the, what they are. So that's the lower right is the clumps I'm talking about. And if you want to uh, really stretch your mind, read a really detailed article about how in the world this actually gets done. You start to think about it carefully, you'll say I'll have questions, and uh, they're, uh, they're challenging. So uh, then what happens uh, is that we, we're still using fluorescent dyes, and we're still using polymerase, and uh, at each stage, uh, you get one base added, and they're one of the four colors, so you'll have clumps of whatever this is, red, green, yellow, and blue, I suppose. Um, and you'll t take a picture to see what base was added at that spot. And you repeatedly do that, and you build up the sequence that's at that spot. You have no idea where in the genome it is, but it's just like the previous thing of leading random pieces, except here we've made it parallel by factors of millions and using a lot less... Uh, materials as well. So here's what, here's a more elaborate picture of what it looks like. There's our polymerase climbing up the, the, the different strands, and there's our colors where they've, uh, bases have been added. <clears throat> uh, this slide, uh, I'm sure people in the uh, workshop saw this slide. Everyone shows this slide, and if there's one thing you might remember from my talk, it's this slide. Uh, so here we have, starting 2001, the cost of just raw sequence. This is not finished sequence, but the raw sequence of million base pairs of DNA. Here's the cost. So it's around $9,000 in 2001, and it's $0.08 cents in 2013. Uh, that, and uh, Moore's Law, I think doubling every year and a half is the Moore's Law shown here. And you can just see this incredible plummeting, super exponential. 
Uh, it's leveled off, and if somebody wants me to conjecture on why it's leveled off a little bit, but uh, it's not done. It's just people aren't pushing it as hard as they were. And you probably heard all this talk about the $1,000 genome. And if we were all to uh, spit in a cup and send the cups to uh, BGI in Shenzhen in China, it would cost about $750 per person. And there's a factor of 10 sitting here, I, I'm convinced. So, you know, when you go to your doctor, what, to open my doctor's door costs $200, right, just to go see him. So our, our, to have this raw information even updated uh, is going to be cheaper than an office call to our doctor. So it's, this, is, this is going to be a, a central part of our health care. But what about with all these reads, with these millions of reads, what about this process I was just talking about? And you just have entirely uh, too, many, too much data. Uh, the graphs are just too complicated to uh, figure out how to do sequence assembly with this. The old method. So something new had to happen. And there's a method using Eulerian graphs. So we can go back to, I guess, the 18th century. And uh, the scheme, and I'll, I'll, I'll work you through this as we go along, but you take these reads, and these next generation sequencing reads aren't 800 long, they're now up to 100 or so, but they started to be 30 and 50 at the beginning. So you had these short reads, but however long the reads are, you break them up into even smaller pieces, and you take every 25 letter word moving along the read, and you do that for every read in your millions of reads, merge the identical, say, and the, 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 the word size is probably 20, some number that's uh, would make random repetition uh, very unlikely, say 25 letters. Merge the identical uh, words and then find a Larian path through here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. But you, as you surely remember, a Larian path is one that visits each edge once and only once, and a Larian circuit starts at, the, starts at the beginning and comes back to the same place. Um, we'll, we have no luck of doing that in genome data, but that's what we'd like. So let me just uh, refresh your memory about how these graphs go. And um, the idea is that we're going to take three-letter words for uh, ease of talking about it. And remember, Euler's trick was to make the bridges into edges, not have the bridges be the vertices. That was the trick in the Konigsberg's bridge problem. It's the same thing here. You take the data, and the data goes on the edges. So our first data point is ATG, and that is uh, vertex AT going to vertex TG. So the edge is ATG. And we keep doing this, and I won't bore you. That's what the, the graph looks like. So it's, a, it's, it's not a very complicated graph, but there's some decisions you might have to make. Um, and of course, this k equal 3 words are corresponding my k equal 25 words for my reads and my sequencing. So what am I going to do? Uh, at best, I have a nice graph. How do I determine the sequence? And uh, I, I love teaching this because this is, it's just a great data structure. Uh, allow me to start with AT. And I move to TG. Uh, I add a letter. And you, for the next step, you'd think you'd have to be smart and pick the uphill branch instead of the horizontal branch. But let's imagine, it, maybe you remember Eulerian graphs, it really doesn't matter. Just remember there was an unexplored edge and you went on, on your way. And of course we have the same situation at the second uh, cycle here. And we will go horizontal again. And uh, all you have to do is go back um, to the unexplored edge or unexplored edges and follow those out. And you just keep, you just remember where there was a bridge you didn't cross in the way. Uh, anyway, then we add a, uh, where did I, oh, I guess I'm sorry, I was uh, off. So I'm, I'm, do, I'm doing the right, the right most cycle. Okay, uh, so the first step, we, we add a C, then we add a G, and then we add a C, and we've taken care of that. We've come back to where we were. There's no unexplored edges, so we go to the other unexplored edge, um, add a T, add a G, and we're done. So uh, if we looked at this, 
uh, as a Hamiltonian graph and made the data into the vertices, even this simple problem has a much more complicated looking environment. So uh, this, this method, uh, my postdoc Ramon Ittery and I wrote a paper about this in 1995. And absolutely no one noticed it. No one, I, I, maybe two people in the world figured out there was an idea in this paper. Everyone just completely ignored it, uh, including uh, Solera. Um, but I still thought it was a good idea. And uh, in the early 2000s, of course, people had to come back and figure out how to reduce the computation, and this is what they came back to. So again, take each read, break the reads into uh, overlapping k-words, merge the identical k-words, and find a Larian pass. And that, that somehow does, and, and in, in a uh, next generation sequencing project, these stacks would be uh, maybe 50 deep. And you'd be able to replace those overlap calculations just by projections, uh, if you're lucky, into one dimension. <clears throat> So the great thing about this, if you don't mess around, it's linear time. You've avoided pairwise alignment, which I spent my life doing. You, spent, you avoid the layout. You avoid the consensus. You read the sequences. You traverse the graphs. And uh, one letter missing or additional is no worse than uh, a letter that's, that's wrong. It's just a little bubble in the graph. Uh, orientation. So uh, Ramana and I realized that we could solve the orientation problem by doubling our computational problem, take every read, put it in its reverse complement, move on. Uh, then you, don't, you, you save uh, all, all, all this layout stuff that uh, some of Gene's papers were really uh, very involved. Now, the problem with this, of course, is there are edges that are wrong, the graph is tangled, and the storage requirements are uh, amazing. You and Bernie at uh, EBI uh, had huge budgets for buying more and more storage. Um, and this is just the erroneous edges when there's an error and you're moving along this k-word thing, the error is probably, is probably unique in the genome. So this little bubble on the side will have uh, much less weight than the main path. And so Ramon and I trimmed those bubbles off. Uh, Pavel Pesner changed the error into something that agreed with the data and called it error correction, which just sounds so much better than bubble trimming. And uh, so a version of this uh, Alarian graph problem uh, is that what you'd like to do is do an Alarian path through the graph and break as few reads as possible. Um, and in and, and that um, vein, Ramon and I, at the beginning, kept every k-tuple had a list of the read numbers and the position numbers in those reads that it came from. And that way, we, we traversed the graph very efficiently. And that was uh, the first thing people gave up. Forgot all of that information and just used the k-words. And uh, then further to reduce the, the storage, uh, they, uh, people uh, managed to uh, double the, put in the reverse complements by just having one, one of the k-words to not both. Uh, there are various, uh, lots, lots of approaches to this. Uh, distributed hash tables uh, uh, comes in. Uh, they forget multiplicity of edges, which to me would be death. I couldn't uh, do this at all. Um, and there's a guy named Jim York who's famous for period two implies chaos this dynamical, famous dynamical system guy who works in this area, and he has a way of choosing what he calls minimizers. So out of each read, he'll pick a couple of k-words that sort of summarizes the read and allows the uh, overlap calculations in the graph to be done uh, much, more, much more efficiently. So, so there's some re interesting stuff here. Uh, now I want to switch to coverage. How do we know how much of the genome we're getting? And... Um, my paper with Eric Lander in the late 80s uh, had the, fo the following simple model. Number n reads of length L, the genome of length G, and the parameter we added was the fraction of overlap that you'd have to have before you believed it to be overlap. Just that simple fraction. Um, and uh, our, our formula, and we assumed that the reads were laid out according to a homogeneous Poisson process. Everything was uniform. 
and we calculated things like the number of, 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 isle, of contig islands that you'd get for this process, the length of the islands, the fraction of the genome covered, and so on. Um, and of course, these were, these were used a lot, but they were, the formulas were as optimistic as you could be. It assumed everything was, was happening in a uniform way. <clears throat> uh, paired in reads are, are used very often and uh, essential in, in the human genome pro program. Uh, the coverage analysis is much harder to do. I had some students work on this. Terry Speed did. Uh, never been a complete uh, analysis of the, pair, of the stochastics of the paired in reads. But anyway, people have thought about it. And David C. has this nice information theory analysis of coverage that connects to this. Um, these formulas were really useful in 1990. But today, with, with um, coverage of depth 50 or 100, uh, they, they just, uh, even though Illumina recommends they use Erickson my formulas, they're not useful anymore. And uh, essentially, uh, what, they, what, the, what they don't get right is the, co is, is the coverage just isn't uniform and it really matters. And my colleague Andrew Smith at USC has pioneered this b beautiful new approach. So I'll try to, try to explain this to you. So you have these two molecules and you're, you're, you're amplifying them. And there's something called polymerase chain reaction which is used to amplify the molecules. And if five, five, four of the first of the orange molecule is chosen but only one of the blue, then you'll have a very uneven uh, distribution of these two molecules. And in fact, uh, the reason Solera's genome project worked so well is that they had a Nobel Prize winner, Hamilton Smith, building libraries. So he built the library of the human genome incredibly carefully, and they didn't build very many. The public project had libraries all over the place. They were of immensely uh, uneven quality. Um, and what you'd like is what Andrew calls a high-complexity library, where the, the pieces you're trying to read are in there uniformly distributed. But what happens is oftentimes these libraries will be uh, very unevenly distributed, and you'll spend all your time resequencing the same darn thing. <clears throat> so, um, so his recommendation is you, 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 you take a library, you um, say do a million reads, and you do a test. And just to show you how you, you don't necessarily um, guess these things right easily. The orange uh, guy here gets 99.5% of the next reads uh, are unique. The blue one gets 97%, and the red one, if that's red, gets 98. But then if you sequence 50 million reads, the red one, the, the orange one's doing well. The red one, while you would have chosen it over the blue, you shouldn't have. How can you tell? So this goes back to... Uh, an R.A. Fisher idea called capture recapture. And uh, it's just trying to estimate how many species are out there when you've only seen the species you've seen. And the modern application of that is this wonderful Brad Efron paper, how many words did Shakespeare know? There's no and when did he know it? I guess he knew it back when he was alive. But uh, he used 14,376 words once, 4,342 twice, and so on. And uh, they estimate that he knew uh, at least 35,000 words. So for our case, it's how many species, how many unseen genetic variation, how big, how big, how big is the unseen genome you're left to, uh, to get at. So um, here's a, just a plot. You get to see the, um, the number of unique guys, the number you saw twice, the number you saw three times and you want to estimate the number you didn't see at all. And it's, it's really, it's beautiful work. So popping on to the next subject of sequence comparison, uh, biologists began to use sequence comparison in the 60s, I think. Um, Pauling and Zucker Candle said, we could learn something about evolution from these sequences. So we did sequence alignment to learn the relationship between uh, sequences from different species. Um, but then in modern times, uh, sequence comparison is, to, is looking uh, between, say, uh, different genomes and finding pieces of the genomes that are uh, significantly similar to one another. And you have to do algorithm statistics. So here's just a picture. Uh, this is, again, back to this alignment stuff. 
Uh, w, H are identical letters. A is, is deleted or inserted, depending on who you are. And T and Y is a mismatch. So you score the scoring positive for match letters you like. Uh, global alignment that we did in the early 70s has a, a quadratic uh, dynamic programming algorithm, and it maximizes over the exponential number of alignments, the maximum alignment score, and gives you the alignment. And my paper with Temple Smith, which was which I wrote the draft of in, uh, in I think, the spring of 80 here in Honolulu, uh, it, uh, it finds the two pieces of the sequence with maximum score also in quadratic time. And uh, the, the famous heuristic for that is BLAST, which is, I think, the most used computer program by biologists, uh, 60,000 citations. It's a heuristic for the dynamic programming algorithm. And, it, and really very smart. Uh, so how do, how do we speed, speed those things up? Um, and uh, we don't get smarter when we speed things up, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, but uh, there was a statistic around um, uh, called D2, which you do the, the, the again, we'll stick with K-word, the K-word counts in, in the two sequences. Uh, for example, you look at the number of triple A's that occur in the A sequence, the number of triple A's that occur in the B sequence, and multiply those numbers together and add over all possible three-letter words. Um, and there's an amazing flaw in this, in this uh, statistic. It approaches the product of normals when the, when the letter distribution is uniform, and it approaches a sum of normals if the letter distribution isn't uniform. And the sum of normals is totally in, uninformative. And maybe I can show you why. Um, being a statistician, I like centered random variables. So take the counts, the number of w's in x, and subtract off the expectation. Take the count of the number of w's in y, subtract off the expectation. And then write d2 as that sum. And the, um, the sum of normals from um, non-uniform distributed guys uh, comes from the second and the third term. And they dominate the statistic, D2, uh, which makes it uninformative. In fact, the variance of D2 is cubic when the, when the distribution isn't uniform, and it's quadratic when the distribution is uniform. So there's really a sort of a phase thing there. And we worked on this. Uh, Larry Shep, who was an amazing person, uh, when he was a young whippersnapper, had uh, showed that if x and y are mean zero normals, if you multiply them and divide by the sum of the, the sum of the square root of the sum of the squares, you get something that's also normal. And we like the look of that because it sort of normalized the terms in this way. And we normalize the terms in sort of the standard way by uh, dividing by an approximate of the standard deviation. And those things are more powerful, but they have all kinds of weird properties that I don't have time to tell you about for sure. But at any rate, um, what I've tried to tell you is several uh, aspects of genome assembly and analysis, and to show you why that slide with the um, exponential increasing uh, data had just run us down in the road, and we've had to learn to do different things. So uh, this is big data from next generation sequencing, and uh, again, uh, I think it's really a safe prediction. There's another factor of 10 there, so we'll have to become smarter yet. I think I've got just a few minutes. So I talked about these problems, but A, I knew a little bit about them, at least their beginnings, and uh, it was easier to communicate. But even here, if you really want to work on these things, figuring out, for example, what the sequencing machine is doing, how it makes its errors, um, worrying about these libraries, all the stuff is re re really, it's really important to get into the details. And these are the easiest conceptual problems in this whole field, and I'll just talk for maybe four slides about um, something that's a, a, a step up. Here's the standard central dogma that you and all your kids in high school, or maybe junior high, have seen. Uh, DNA makes DNA, DNA makes RNA, RNA makes protein. And we want to understand how the, the genome is operating. So what, one of the first things you think about is how genes are turned on and turned off. And there are conglomerations of proteins that bind uh, where that polymerase is starting to copy or not to copy that has to do with this control. Sometimes there's feedback loops. Um, 
and we in the last few years have discovered our, our so-called microRNAs that get in there and stick to the messenger RNA either help it or hinder it from, from becoming a protein. Uh, and if this sounds too simple, if you know the story that um, eukaryotic uh, genes are broken up in introns and exons, the average human gene has something like eight or nine different uh, coding transcripts that can come from it. So instead of being 25,000 genes, it's eight times 25 products. Um, so here's uh, uh, a network that appeared in Science for, for yeast. Um, so there's a picture from the uh, transcription factors that are binding to uh, affect the transcription of the gene to the target genes. Uh, people trying to understand how these things are, are intertwined and interrelated. Uh, how proteins interact, because I said there was a conglomeration of proteins in the, in the region in front of the gene. Uh, there's something called a yeast to hybrid system to measure protein-protein interactions. Uh, it misses 60% of the protein interactions, and the ones it finds, some good percentage of those are wrong. So this is, this is data that's not clean. Uh, but people uh, make protein-protein interaction networks trying to understand the, how, how biology is operating. So um, this stuff, if you're going to get into this stuff, uh, find a biologist that uh, you like to talk to and can understand when he, when he talks. And uh, it, 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 it's a lot of fun, but there are, there are a, lo a lot of details. So I think all... Oh, and microarrays. This... This, this kept statistics departments alive the last 15 years. Uh, you, you give statisticians an array of numbers, and they're, they're happy guys and gals. Uh, so uh, microarrays, uh, this would be, say, rows of genes. Uh, different, the, the columns would be uh, conditions for the genes, and um, the dots that have to do with the expression of those genes, the products of those genes. And the data here is so noisy that the same equipment in two different labs in the same building operating in the same material might produce data that's a factor of five apart. So uh, there's, some, there's some real data processing needs to go on here. And again, statisticians are in mess of this. Uh, and of course, there's a huge biological literature. Gene ontology, I think, is what go, go means. So there's a huge literature there to find out what those genes are supposed to be doing to see if what you found makes sense or doesn't make sense or so on. So uh, I think that's enough. So my theme, of course, here is that new technology can kill problems we love, but it also creates new problems we could love if we figured out what they were. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk. We do have time for some questions, so if there are any questions, there's microphones floating around somewhere, or should be. Are there any questions? Uh, Andrea, perhaps wait until the microphone. So, so why do humans have fewer genomes than worms and yeast? <laughs> I mean, is there any conjecture about well, that? I, I, no, I, I, this is really a wonder. And also look at plants. They have huge genomes, and, and there are species of plants that don't even keep track of the chromosome number. Uh, and they can do that, and you and I, if we have an extra chromosome three, we are, we are, we are sick. Uh, I, I can't answer that question at all. Evolution is uh, an amazing thing. So you made a few references to dynamic programming. Yeah during your yeah. talk. Yes. I, I don't know whether you are aware that uh, in, your f in your cellular phone you have a dynamic programming algorithm. I, I don't think I know that. Thank okay. You. So, um, so in fact, uh, in communications, we have two flavors of dynamic programming that play a major role. Uh, one is uh, the forward version, and the other one is the forward-backward version. The first one gives you the most likely <coughs> guess. Right. And the second one gives you uh, a minimum bit error rate guess. So I'm, I'm just curious about which flavor of the two you're using. So, so myself, I use the forward version, but Viterbi algorithm is, is endemic in, in, in molecular biology analysis. So, so uh, I think both, both show up. And, and 
Yeah. Are you aware that it was invented in UCLA, not in USC? <laughs> I, I didn't know I put any claim on inventing dynamic program. <laughs> Hi. So uh, you mentioned that uh, the overlap consensus problem is MP hard because it involves a Hamiltonian path problem. Yeah. But then you solved it using a Eulerian approach. Right. So how do you solve an MP hard problem using a linear time algorithm? Well, uh, I mean, look, look at the Koningsberg, answer that problem for the Koningsberg bridges, and you've got that, it's right there. It's the same, same thing. There, there are some places where this formulation works and some it doesn't. And I, I think people in combinatorics have, have, have uh, studied that. I, I absolutely haven't. Uh, but it, it's a really good. Why does uh, why does the example I told you about get somewhere, and the traveling salesman problem doesn't, for example, with this transformation? So, hi. Um, so my question is also about the uh, dynamic programming uh, thing. Um, so you said like in the human genome project they didn't use uh, this like uh, method with uh, quadratic complexity. I was wondering like what, 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 like, what was the reason? Oh, well, the, the reason was time, of course. And um, the, uh, the shortcuts were to uh, only, you know, only look at overlaps that had, um, you know, one, one uh, one, one uh, keyword of 25 letters common to them, or seven of them common to them. There's, uh, there's kind of neat stuff for looking at um, word content and uh, getting the, uh, the longest match with no more than two mismatches or something like that. So uh, it's in uh, text searching. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a bit about your last slide. It said about technology uh, making some <laughs> problems obsolete. Yes. Uh, I wanted to get your opinion about, for example, Oxford nanopores, which may basically produce super long reads that can obsolete assembly algorithms. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's uh, I'll just ramble a minute. I, when the Genome Project started, there was a fund of money for technology development. And I expected Sanger sequencing to be, uh, to be overturned. Um, and of course, that didn't happen until after the Genome Project. Um, but I, I mean, I'm very keen on longer, longer uh, high quality reads. I'm just waiting to see them reliably produced. But, uh, um, you know, um, this uh, BGI, this uh, company in China, uh, just bought a, a, a sequencing. Um, Complete genomics, I think. Uh, they, they, they bought their own sequencing machine company uh, because they weren't happy with what uh, Illumina was selling them. So, so this is a very, I, I, I just sit back and watch this. This is, uh, is my spectator sport is to see what goes on in this area. Sure. So in the same vein, uh, can you talk a little bit about errors? Uh, and, uh, I mean, to me, it seems from your talk that the way you deal with errors is just resequence the same place over and over again. But um, that just doesn't seem to me a very efficient way. Is there something that people came up with? Oh, are, are you uh, sort of worried about the redundancy of the reads? Um, or, or, or just understand the error structure from the understand machines? Understand error structure, not of the yeah. machines, but of the genome itself, because we are all different. I mean, Sort of, I know. I, I, I mean, yeah. I, so the errors I've been talking about are errors, are computational errors or machine errors in reading the DNA. But of course, there's uh, the uh, polymerase chain reaction, which is always amplifying these guys, which make mistakes. Um, and uh, of course, uh, there are a few uh, mistakes that get uh, added on to when we proliferate cells and, and have kids and stuff. So I don't know whether you mean the biological error structure, which is really a fundamental biological problem. It's really fascinating. How does polymerase 
figure out when it's made a mistake and correct that and so on. There's a lot of error correction in cellular machinery, uh, which is in some sense the most interesting kinds of, of errors, but not the kind I've been talking about here at all. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks a lot for listening.